at the end of the day, gardening is all about understanding exactly where you are in the landscape. So it doesn't matter how tough or extreme the environment is, if you choose the right plants, your garden will thrive. Tonight on The Odyssey, the wonders of lavender. The colour here is so intense. It's an absolute feast for the senses. How choosing the right plants can make your garden survive the heat. I'm almost expired, yet the plants here, they're not wilting, they love it. And one man's mission, to change the way we look at weeds. Well, once you cook it up, that hairiness isn't a problem. No, the hairiness is really nice. How beautiful is this? A rich tapestry of colours, textures and flowers. Made all the more amazing by the fact that today is an absolute scorcher. In fact, in this part of the dry plains of central Victoria, an hour and a half northwest of Melbourne, it's not unusual for temperatures to be in the high 40s in the summer and around freezing in the winter with little or no rainfall. What then is the secret to creating such spectacular gardens like this and how can you do it at home? I'm here to meet a man who, after failing to grow an English cottage garden in his new homeland, learnt a very simple but effective horticultural lesson and in the process created a beautiful landscape. I couldn't have wished for a better day to explore dry climate gardening. I mean, it's in the mid-40s the sun is belting down. I feel like I'm in a fan-forced oven. But you step in between the hedge here and there's this garden. It hasn't been watered for nine months. I'm almost expired, yet the plants here, they're not wilting, they're not struggling. They're happy, they're colourful, they make you feel good. This is Burnside and it's the display garden of plantsmen David Glenn. David, on our way here, I was driving past a lot of very dry paddocks and then we come to your garden and it's just, it's just a garden paradise, really. Well, it's because we've chosen plants that don't need much water but, and also look like they enjoy the hot and the dry too. David was born in the East Midlands of England where it was considered hot when the mercury tipped just 23. He spent years trying to emulate the garden plants and style of his homeland before realising that it was a big mistake. I was in Australia for 30 years before I really started trying to garden in a way that made sense with the climate. As a migrant, you always seem to have this nostalgia for the old country, oh, you know, and yeah. I just had, had that. I suppose I, I changed my garden style about the time I stopped supporting England cricket and started supporting Australia. So when Alan Bordy was made captain, that's when I started gardening seriously. <laughs> the lesson David learnt was that it's crucial to plant the garden to match the climate it's in. And so instead of using typical English garden plants, David started using plants from around the world that suited the hot, dry conditions here. These are plants from Greece and Turkey, these ornamental oregonums. The um, yuccas are from the um, southern United States, the dry areas of the southern United States. The tall spires, spiky things there, they're from Mexico. So you can just see that they're all from these sort of drier sort of areas of the world. David uses a mixture of common dry climate plants like yuccas as well as some more exotic types that he's imported and then sells himself, like this verbascum splendium from Turkey. What dry climate characteristics does this plant hold? Well, it's pretty efficient at getting its roots down into the moisture, but also you can see this sort of lovely felty grey leaves, and it's the greyness, those hairy 
surface on the leaves that protects it from the sun. Perovskia atriplikifolia, or Russian sage, is an absolute veteran of the dry climate garden. It's got these amazing grey leaves and stems, and off that are these amazing flowers that, from a distance, are just a sea of purple. Interestingly, this plant is actually from Afghanistan. But what has really struck me most about this garden is the focus on flowers, which are a reminder of the beauty of nature, but which are also important for attracting insects. Just like the bees, I was immediately attracted to this Echinops hybrid. From a distance, it's got the appearance of a thistle in its texture, but what I really love is the head. It starts off as a purple colour, and as the flowers open, it goes to a greyish white. What a great transformation. The garden is a life's work in progress for David and his wife, celebrated artist Chris Kenning. Although we want the garden to look wild, in a sense, an idealised sort of Mediterranean hillside sort of look, mm. You do have to intervene, and we intervene all the time, just trimming things back, deadheading. Um, and it's better for the plant. Yeah, and uh, especially in the hot weather, that's important because the flowers go over quite quickly at times. You know? Yeah. So we cut things back very quickly so that we can get that sort of fresh green growth mm. and those new, new flowers coming. So the message here is pretty simple. It is possible to have a colourful, vibrant garden grown on little water, no matter where you live as long as you keep your soil nourished with organic matter and choose the plants that best suit your climate. Oh, and it also helps if, like David, you have a little bit of passion for it. I don't know why I love gardening so much. God, what a question. I just do, you know. Do you have, you know, why do you like breathing? <laughs> Generally, in times of drought, it's weeds that seem to thrive. But I reckon a weed is just a plant in the wrong place at the wrong time. In fact, I reckon the best way to control them is to learn how to eat them. And we're going to meet someone who's going to show us how. Not far away from David's dry garden is the home of Alexis Pitsopoulos. And where most people see an overgrown backyard, Alexis sees dinner. So this is your kitchen garden? Uh, this is part of it, yeah. Most people are going to look at this and think that uh, the house hasn't been rented for five years. And That's right, It's yeah. just been left well, uh, yeah, overgrown. My, my uh, gardener gets great pleasure out of the fact that I ask her to mow the lawn and uh, mow around the weeds. Mow around the weeds, she I like that. thinks that's pretty funny. <laughs> You see, like most of my family, Alexis believes that there are many varieties of weeds that are a great source of nutrition, not to mention their apparent medicinal properties. This is a uh, ribwort plantain. Ribworts are everywhere. Yeah, oh, that's, I mean, you look in any lawn and you'll see that. You could use this in smoothies or add to a juice. Apparently it's very high in silica uh, and it can be um, quite good for your hair. Oh, I might um, have to get a bit of that. Yeah, well, we could probably do with some. Just to <laughs> look after the hair. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is crazy. But I can tell you that I grew up on horta, as Greeks love the bitter taste for use in salads or a side dish. Um, there we go. That's a flatweed right there. We're actually going to make up some horta from ah. this. Nice. But you can see the hairiness of the Yeah, it is a bit hairy. That's what you're looking for in a good uh, flatweed. So that w once you cook it up, that hairiness isn't a problem? No, the hairiness is really nice. Yeah. yeah. It, it makes it really soft to eat. Talking my language. Mm. I like hairiness. Alexis believes that the tough nature of their growing conditions provides the weeds with added vigour, which he feels creates health benefits not seen in cultivated plants. Alexis, it must be 42 degrees in the middle of the road here, and that's, that's your classic bit of suburban wasteland between the footpath and the gutter. Yeah. What have we got here, though? Well, some great edible plants here. Not that you'd probably eat them from here, because it's going to be sprayed and car fumes and... This is amaranth. Look at it. I mean, it's, it's, it's boiling hot. It's not even wilted. And it's in this 
this ground, the soil. you couldn't break that with a jackhammer. Yeah, I mean, you try and grow a cauliflower in that. <laughs> and also on here, we've got some purslane. Yeah. One of the most amazing things about this plant is that it uh, contains omega-3 fatty acids, which are usually in fish and animal products like that. It's very succulent, as you can see. Yeah. It's very refreshing in salads. I mean, makes a great summer vegetable. When foraging for weeds, make sure to do some research so that what you're picking isn't poisonous, and then go to places that haven't been sprayed. The best place to start is your own backyard. This here is another beauty. This is a spear thistle. So that actually is quite tasty, even just raw. They've got a beautiful flavour steamed. What nutrients is that going to give me? The thistles, you're going to get those liver, uh, those bitter liver uh, cleansing, cleansing, detoxifying nutrients. So after a big night out, people should be uh, looking around in the paddocks near their house for chomping under a bit of thistle. Well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Alexis got his interest in weeds through his work as a chef. And so after the break, he's going to whip up some tasty weed wonders. Alexis Pitsopoulos loves to eat weeds. So much so that he's going to whip me up a bit of a weedy feast. What we could do, Costa, is uh, cook something you might remember from your childhood, a very traditional uh, village Greek dish called horta. Horta is a broad term used to describe a wide variety of flat leaf plants. In Greece, it's also used to describe this dish, where, like Alexis is doing here, many broadleaf plants are mixed together, boiled twice, and then covered in a garlic, olive oil, and lemon dressing. It's all done, Alexis. Now, if anything is going to fire up the Greek language gods, <laughs> this may spontaneously do it. Let's see. Mmm. Nostimo. Orea, eh? Orea, man. From a paddock near you. <laughs> <laughs> there can be little doubt that this region 100 kilometres northwest of Melbourne is like a little piece of the Mediterranean in Australia. I mean, have a look at this lavender. It's just thriving in these European-like conditions. Standing here, surrounded by the intensity of the purple, the hum of the bees, and the aroma of this lavender, it's amazing. This is Lavangela, a boutique commercial lavender farm that Carol White started some 20 years ago, initially as a way to make ends meet. I was a single mum with two kids and I needed a crop that a single person could manage. I didn't know how to drive a tractor then. I didn't know how to push a lawnmower. I knew how to dig and I knew I could cut lavender with a hand sickle and I'd seen them doing that in Europe. Built by Swiss-Italian immigrants in the 1850s, Carol fell in love with the rustic stone cottage on this two-hectare property. And she could visualise its transformation into a little bit of Europe in central Victoria. I like the idea of a beautiful house like this one, this cottage, to have gardens that complement it. So not just a row of roses across the front, but vista gardens, I call them where you plant a crop but it actually looks like a garden. What started initially as a venture with only 1,000 plants has expanded to these magnificent fields and Carol couldn't have picked a better plant for the conditions here. I mean, it really mirrors the climate where it grows in Mediterranean climates, really harsh winters, hot summers. It survives both fairly easily. In fact, hot summers they adore and it actually increases their oil content. Lavender has been used for centuries. In the 3rd century BC, the Greek physician Throphrastus wrote about its healing qualities. The Egyptians used it in mummification and the Romans bathed in it. And these days, not much has changed. It's still being used for its healing qualities for a wide range of ailments. Not to mention the horticultural and visual benefits that it can bring to your garden. Carol, what would you recommend as a good lavender for your average backyard? Well, I think this lavender. This is the all-round lavender. <laughs> <laughs> it is all around. Yeah. This is an English variety called Miss Donnington. It's hardy, easy to grow, 
attracts bees as pollinators and so is a great companion plant. That's what you want in your garden. Yep. You know, you need it for your veggies, you need it for your roses, you need it for anything really, your fruit trees, your olives. So every house should have a lavender bush. Lavenders are part of the Lamiaceae family, the same as mint, and there are about 25 species that range in colour from white to pink and, of course, vivid purple. Lavenders are easy to grow from cuttings, so gardener Melissa Pickering is going to let us in on a few lavender tricks of the trade. So we take a cutting, we cut it just beneath the node there. Yep. You want the cutting to be about 10 centimetres in length, so we'll take the top off there. We then remove the bottom third of the foliage. We then dip it in the rooting hormone. What's that do? It's to stimulate the um, root growth. And we pop it in the growing media. It's a pretty cheap and easy way to do it. It's very cheap and easy, yep, and anyone can do it. When taking cuttings, plant them in a well-drained potting mix until they form roots. Once in the garden, lavenders don't need much fertiliser, but like a bit of lime and potassium in the spring to promote good flower colour. If you decide to buy one from the nursery, It'll be about this big in the pot. After one year, you can see it starts to take size. After two years, already they're starting to grow together. Now, ideally, this species needs to be planted at about a metre apart per plant. So that after 10 years, look at it in its mature form. It's beautiful. And this gets cut back to this height, which is about 800 millimetres high by about a metre wide. So remember this, the final size of it, when you're picking it and planting it. Because if you put it too close to your path, it'll grow right over the top of it. What's really interesting to me about being here at Lavangela is that it's like stepping back in time. The harvest is labour intensive and the stems on each bush are cut by hand with a sickle to protect the precious flower heads. It's incredibly relaxing doing this. You've got the smell of the lavender as you brush against it, the sound of the bees humming in the background, and it's not a hard action, it's just peaceful. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Every year it's a good idea to cut your lavender back to promote flowering for the next season. When you're pruning, you must remember not to cut into the old wood, just above the old wood. So you can imagine that every year the bush grows a little bit bigger, you're cutting above the old wood, so naturally your bush is going to stay bigger. Here, once the flowers are harvested, they are hung under the veranda in bunches to dry, before the seeds are processed to release the oil, used to create healing and body products like these. It's refreshing too, yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. It's nice. Once a year, Lavangela celebrates all things lavender at its harvest festival, where you can come along and immerse yourself in this beautiful and productive plant. It would be rude of me to leave the festival without tasting some of the wonderful produce made with lavender. First of all, the light stuff. Lavender lemonade, really refreshing on a hot day. What about a good old scone with lavender? How tasty is that? And of course, some lavender shortbread, washed down with some lavender champagne. Cheers. Mmm. Beautiful. After the break, and it's the final stage of our backyard revolution. Is that a carpet or what? No Aussie backyard would be complete without a bit of lawn for the kids. And so at our backyard revolution, the scene of our 12-week abundant and sustainable garden transformation, today is lawn laying day. On any landscaping job, big or small, I work to one simple philosophy, grass is last. And the exciting thing about the backyard revolution is that we're at the last stage. And by the end of today, this sandy area is going to be transformed into a beautiful level grass area for the kids to play on. Something that we promised them right from the start. Like most things in the garden, having successful lawn is all about preparation. And so last week, I put in the hard yards to get the bed right for our grass by rotary hoeing the soil, then adding a layer of sand to help with the drainage. What we're doing now is creating an edge between what will be our grass area here and what's going to become a garden bed all the way around our grass. 
This garden bed is going to have a whole row of rosemary plants in it and they'll grow up as a hedge to create a beautiful border to our grass playing field. There are two main benefits associated with putting in borders like these hardwood sleepers. The first is to contain the grass into one area and the second is to disguise the level change that exists across the garden. The irrigation system I'm putting in consists of these four pop-up rotating head sprinklers. So they go from side to side exactly how you want them to go. They're connected with this 25 millimetre high density poly pipe, which is easy to cut with a pair of snips. It goes in to these joints and there's no need for glue. You just tighten them up like that and it's ready to go. The sprinkler system will be fed from the rainwater tanks and run off a timer. That way, we can use the minimum amount of water required to keep the lawn in tip-top shape. A pop-up sprinkler does just that. It pops up about the height that it is, so to there. So the important thing to remember when you're setting it is make sure that it's 50 millimetres below your grass level. That way, it can pop up safely, but then return and be safe from the vicious blades of your lawnmower. Next up, it's time for the underlay mix. I've had it made up to an 80% sand, 20% topsoil ratio. That way, it will be free draining, encouraging the roots to grow deep down in the soil to find water, making the lawn less affected by the heat of the day. Well, we've finally reached the stage where we're starting to put some icing on our cake. This one is the turf. Guys, come and have a look at this. I got that. What do you think? Cool. cool. This stuff is called cooch grass. Cool. Winter green, so it stays quite green over the winter. How smooth and soft is that? Oh, I could sleep on these. I could too, but it's actually quite strong. And with some irrigation and a little bit of care, that is going to make a great carpet for playing all sorts of games on, all right? Yeah. Want to give me a hand rolling it out? Yep. yep. OK, let's go. First roll. To add the final touches to the garden, I'm installing a hedge of rosemary around our grass section, along with some kiwi and passion fruit that will grow over our feature tunnel. Well, that's it for this week on The Revolution. And, you know, looking back over the last 12 weeks, I can't help but feel this great excitement building because we've gone from a design, a discussion, the hopes and dreams of Angela and all the kids, and suddenly it's now jumped out of the ground and we've got this 3D reality of what they all wanted. But the ultimate test will be next week when we gather the extended Tembaleski clan, family and friends, to put the new garden to the test, the ultimate test of the backyard revolution. Next week in the series Final Odyssey, how the backyard revolution has changed this family's carbon footprint. We've saved about 50% on water already. Wastage, it's all going to the chickens. What we can learn from a pile of trash a lot of people would call this a pile of rubbish. This is really where the sustainability revolution begins. And it's party time at the Tembaleskis. Well, that's it from the Backyard Revolution. <laughs>